you can ask any question about the church, about our denomination, about church history, about the scripture, the hard things, the easy things, all kinds of things. I encourage you to continue to ask the questions, continue to fill out the cards. I've got, I've got a basket in the foyer there with a bunch of three by five cards next to it. So if you think of something over the next few weeks, put it in there. I'm going to get to as many of them as I can throughout this month. But then going on uh, beyond that, you know, we're, we're going to include those in the newsletter and that kind of stuff. And, and, and it may be uh, sermon topics for future sermons, too. Tonight, I wanted to start with two questions, one easy and kind of lighthearted. We can get through that real quick. And then one that's that's paramountly important for our church. It, it has impacted our church so significantly and our community recently so significantly that I really want to bring this point home. I actually, of, of all the questions I received, I saw this and I said, this topic has to be first. We've got to, as a church, stop being silent on it. So, We'll start with the easy one, and then we're going to work into, into the more challenging one. So the very first question uh, that I got uh, in, my, in the box was, what is the significance of poinsettias at Christmas time, and is there a reference to them in the Bible? So we decorate our church every year with poinsettias. We have, we have red and white flowers all over the place. It's become a tradition. All of us, as long as we can remember, it's been a Christmas tradition. So what a, a logical conclusion. This must be in the Bible. Well, it isn't. It's not at all. So the way that we got to poinsettias is that, well, well, let me put it to you. Let, let, let's go back to the Bible. Poinsettias are not indigenous to Israel. Jesus never, ever saw a poinsettia in his lifetime on earth. I'm sure he knows exactly what a poinsettia looks like because he created them. However, in his life on earth, he didn't see one because poinsettias grow in Mexico. And I know Jesus did a lot of walking, and I know he could walk on water, but it's not in the scripture that he walked to Mexico to check them out. Not there. So, so how do we get there? How do we get poinsettias at Christmas time? Well, it's like a lot of traditions. As Christianity grew, we started picking up traditions from other countries that, that apply to ours. So in the 16th century in Mexico, that's the first time we see Christians celebrating with poinsettias. And the story is, is that a little girl named Pepita, she was too poor, she didn't have any money to, or, or to buy Jesus a gift for his birthday. And so her cousin, to cheer her up, said, you know, Jesus doesn't want your money. Jesus doesn't need that. Just give him anything. So as she was walking to the church, she saw some weeds growing on the side of the road, and she picked them and made a bouquet and then brought them to the altar. Now, some of the stories say an angel spoke to her, but again, now we start getting into legend as opposed to, as opposed to history. But anyhow, she left the weeds there at the altar, and there they bloom into red poinsettias. So as far as our meaning to it, it's there's, you know, again, it's like a Christmas tree. Christmas trees, we didn't have Christmas trees until the Victorian era. And in the United States, we didn't have poinsettias until the 1950s, 50s, when a florist decided that they really wanted to market them and brought them home from Mexico and then sent them out to all the TV stations. The Bob Hope show is the one, the one that they reference, and now they became a part of our regular tradition. They're great, though, because they tell the story of Jesus. They tell about the blood. They tell about the innocence, just like a candy cane does. And some folks claim that if you look at the poinsettia, looking straight down, that it looks like the star of Jesus. So it tells the Christmas story in that way. So that's how we get we get them. And um, in in Spanish, I'm going to have a uh, a time with this. Let me. I, I took a note because I knew I was going to have a time with it. Now, now I can't find my note. Uh, the Poinsettia in Mexico uh, is known as Flores de Noche Buena, Flowers of the Holy Night. So there's, there's the story of poinsettias. Not in the Bible. You're not going to find them there, but that doesn't mean that you can't enjoy them. So please take them home. There's two out there that are going to make it. All right. So now we need to get into the serious topic. The next question that we had, and this one, like I said, when the moment I saw this question, I said, we need to discuss this in the church. We've got to stop being silent on this in the church. The question is, why do born-again Christians living for the Lord <coughs> think about suicide when health issues come up? If that does happen, will God still forgive us and will we go to heaven? That's a tough question. 
because suicide has affected, I promise you, it's affected every single person in this room, if not directly, by, by a generation, by two generations. And it's one of those things, as we will learn tonight, that is, is, is a demon that will come out and it will haunt and haunt and haunt, and it never seems to take away. We have to lean in on the Lord. And unfortunately, the church historically has failed tremendously when it comes to this topic. So much so that in history, if a church member died by suicide, the, the tradition was, was to take that person and bury them in the middle of a crossroad of a busy intersection and to put a stake through their heart to make sure that they wouldn't come back. It, I, it, it was a, a an embarrassment to families. The, the church had the right to take, take away the family's entire property and delegate it out to somebody else. So if you were the unfortunate family member of somebody who committed suicide, not only did you suffer that massive loss, but now you had nothing to live off of. Now you had this embarrassment. You had this shame hanging over you. And of course, the church back then said that you, if you committed suicide immediately, you would find yourself in hell. None of that is scriptural. None of that belongs in the church. And over the years, the church has gotten better about it. But unfortunately, this topic is still taboo to talk about in the church. It's one thing that we just don't discuss. It's the dark little secret. Oh, somebody might be struggling. Somebody might have some problems. Well, I don't know how to handle that. I don't know what to do with it. So what we need to do is what God calls us to do with all darkness that comes into the church. We need to shine his light on it. John 1, 4 and 5 says, in him was life and the life was le the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. We need to shine a light on this. We need to talk about it. We need to accept that this sin exists in the world, that this evil exists in the world and that we need to work together to overcome it. We need to support our brothers and sisters who are struggling with a temptation like this so that it doesn't become something far worse. Be sure this is a matter of spiritual warfare. I know that there are mental issues there. I know that there's uh, disease functions that are there. There's all kinds of things that contribute to this. But at the very core of it, this is spiritual warfare. And this particular weapon of Satan's is a mega bomb when it comes to the church. When he succeeds, the 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 impact is catastrophic. It brings down cities. It's not like disease. D the devil loves disease. We, we pray about disease all the time. It's not like disease because at least with disease, there's rhyme and reason. You smoke cigarettes, you wound up with cancer. You live in the world with all these pollutants, you wound up with cancer. You got around people who had COVID, you got COVID. It's easy to explain. But suicide's not the same way. Suicide is so frustrating because you would think like, okay, that person looks depressed. That person looks upset. They're the person most likely to do it. But so often it's successful people. It's people who you look at their lives and you're like, I want to be like them. And they're the ones that do it. The youth group at Fountain of Life a couple of years ago, they came in and one of their friends had committed suicide. The kid was like the lead of the football team. He, he had everything. All the other kids looked up to him. And he was the one that took his life. I think of, of Robin Williams, great comedian, great actor. He had what most of us only dream of having. And yet that demon took his life. We have to be paying attention. We have to be watching out for this. And you can go to the scripture to find it. The scripture is clear. This is something that affects everybody. It's throughout the scripture. Solomon lamented life even when he had everything, even when he had an unmatched wisdom that God had provided him. Ecclesiastes 2, 15 and 17. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then I have been what why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart, this is also vanity. For of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance. See that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. He how the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life 
because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and striving after wind. He had everything, the richest man in history, and yet he grieved to live because there was nothing more to live for in his mindset. Elijah, having seen the deadly power of Jezebel's wrath, 1 Kings 19, 4 through 5, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he asked that he might die, saying, it is enough now, O Lord, take, my, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he laid down and slept under the broom tree. Sometimes the weight of the world, sometimes the terror of the world gets so strong, we don't want to live. Jonah got so angry at God for making him do what he asked him to do and for saving a people that he didn't like that he asked to die. Jonah 4, 1 through 3, and it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry, and he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is it not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. To see God's will fulfilled and be so stirred up and angry on the inside, do you not see Satan's impact on that person's life that you have a hatred for other people so much that when God saves them, you want to die. Finally, we come to the Apostle Paul. He struggled with this when he was suffering in prison, 2 Corinthians 1 and 8. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. This is just a handful. This doesn't even get into some of the bigger, what most well-known suicides in the Bible. And I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm thinking of, of all of them as we go through this. There are so many stories in the Bible that we have to understand that the devil uses this tool to make us despair so badly that he thinks he wins our soul. He wants you to feel helpless. He wants you to feel hopeless. He wants you to feel unsavable. And so he sends his demons after you. Now, before we continue, there's two things that we have to reiterate. You have to, you have to internalize this message right now because it's so important. One, these thoughts and feelings are not sin. They are temptations to sin. Just like Jesus went to the desert, the devil tempted Jesus three times. There is no shame in being tempted. Being tempted means that the devil sees something important in you and he wants to take you out. There's no sin. And that takes us to the second point. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Don't keep it to yourself because that's what the devil wants you to do. He wants to isolate you so that you standing alone can't stand against him. If you have these feelings, reach out, reach out to your church family. And most of all, reach out to the Lord. He will make a way. He will bring us through. This is first and foremost a matter of spiritual warfare. Let's go to the scripture again. John 10, 1 through 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. <clears throat> The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, and they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus said, again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go out 
in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that I may that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves his sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father, I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay down, lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. This is a matter of spiritual warfare and death or Satan wants one thing. He wants to come and steal and destroy and kill. He wants death. There's nothing else that he wants. Suicide is his most direct attack at making this happen. And he has lots of weapons in this arsenal. So we're going to go piece by piece and look at them. Because I promise you, every single person in this room has experienced one level or another of this in their lifetime. Perhaps it comes in the form of untoward thoughts. Those thoughts that sneak into your mind, those dark thoughts that sneak into your mind and you can't explain them. You don't know why you thought that thing. When you're driving up 17 and you think to yourself, what would happen if I went into oncoming traffic? They come and we can't explain them. It's because a voice is speaking to you. It may sound like your voice. Believe me, it's not your voice. It may sound like a voice that you recognize. Believe me, it's no voice to listen to. It is not the voice of our father saying that. It's the voice of a demon trying to tempt you, to pull you down, to take you out because they know that if they succeed, the ramifications are beyond what we can imagine. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, and th for they do not know the voice of strangers. Recognize that it's a stranger's voice, and when you have that dark thought, get in prayer, get connected to the Lord, and push that thought so far away that you can't even begin to fathom it anymore. That will keep you safe from the taunts. We have to call on the shepherd. Now, maybe Satan strengthens up his, his fight a little bit, and we fall on hard times, and we fall into a point where everything seems hopeless. Sometimes you have those times in life where everything you touch seems to turn to rust and fall apart. Your health might be failing. The things that are going on, you just don't know how to handle it. Maybe the bills are way bigger than the paycheck and you're just like, you know what? Maybe the world will be better off without me. This is the time to lean in. You need to lean in to your father and more. Well, no, let me say it the other way around. You need to live into your Christian family. And then more importantly, you need to lean into your father. But this might be the time where you're struggling to hear the father's voice the most. You pray and you don't hear him because the depression, because the hard time is just on you and wearing you out. That's when you lean on this family. Congregation, understand this. We have a huge responsibility in this. When somebody comes to you, they need to be able to trust you. They need to be able to know that when they speak to you, that they're not going to be the topic of gossip tomorrow. That they're not going to pay a price for coming out and saying, I'm struggling. Remember, this isn't a sin. This is a temptation. This is the devil making an attack. We have to come together. And there's one thing I've learned from raising sheep over these past few years. There's a reason why we're related to sheep. Sometimes when the sheep don't know what's going on, when everything's chaotic, when the dog gets out in the field and everybody's running around, the sheep stick together. They all bundle up into a ball and they follow the one that's in the lead. 
Well, I'm going to tell you, if you're at the back of the pack, you might not hear the shepherd. But you know who can? The one at the front of the pack. Follow them. Lean into them. Let them get around you and protect you. Let them get around you and lift you up in prayer and bring you through so that you can hear his voice, so that he can bring you through. Don't let the devil get you by yourself. The devil's going to try to come in and cut you from the flock, put you out by yourself, and he will devour you. Get close with each other. Congregation, we cannot be responsible. We are the body of Christ. And if we cause somebody to fail, we might as well cut off one of our own members. Stick with him. Stick with each other. Next, the devil may turn up the heat more. He may come after you like Job. Job is the hardest book in the Bible to understand. I read that book and I struggle. Why does God have this bargaining conversation with the devil? But sometimes we don't understand God's way. Sometimes God has something bigger in store. So when we find ourselves in a situation like Job, we have to be like Job and maintain the faith, be strong in the faith, seek the Lord above all. The devil sometimes comes after your health. That's what this question was about. When, when my health is impacted, go to Job. Go to the Lord. Go in prayer. Isaiah 41, 8, and 12, or 8 through 12. <coughs> Excuse me. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corner, saying to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, before I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all who are incensed against you shall be put to shame and confounded. Those who strive against you shall be as nothing and shall perish. That was the promise that God made to Israel. Now, if God made that promise to Israel, think of how much more important you are that God sent his son to die for your sins. And now the devil dare to try to steal your life from him. Think of how much he will confound and punish Satan for doing that. Trust him. Trust that he will bring you through on the other side. We are victorious in Christ. We come to one last piece, and this is this is where really this gets challenging. This gets really hard to speak of because I think of my friends, families who have gone through this. I think of the calls that I've responded to where we've seen somebody go through this. What happens when our family member commits suicide? Was the church right at one point saying that once you commit suicide, that's it, off to hell with you, no second chance, no chances at survival? No, the scripture doesn't say that. The scripture says that this, that suicide is a sin. It is the sin of murder. You have killed yourself. You murdered yourself. But let's be clear about what Jesus says. Jesus says that if I so much have anger with my brother, I've already committed murder. When we condemn our friends or our family members who committed suicide and say, no, they're in eternal hell right now. We're casting a mighty big stone that we don't have permission to cast. The judgment is up to God alone. We don't know where their heart condition was. We don't know where their faith was. But I'm telling you, I do know that they were under attack by Satan. And maybe he just had a lethal blow that time. But Jesus is the victor. Jesus paid for our sins. And Jesus gets to make that final judgment. That's where we need to be. This is, this is so important. Matthew 12, 31 and 32. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the son of man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. That is the sin of apostasy, the only one sin in the Bible that is unforgivable. Suicide was not that sin. 
We can trust in the Lord that his judgment will be fair and will be just. We can trust that our family member who gave their life, who was saved, who followed Jesus all their life, will see the kingdom. Now we come to the hard part. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the rewards in heaven. We said rewards in heaven saying that, oh, you're going to have a Maserati and all these wonderful things in heaven. That doesn't make sense. That's not scriptural. Your gifts in heaven will not be material things. Your gifts in heaven will not be your proximity to Jesus because we're going to be spirits. We're not going to be material things. We're all going to have proximity to Jesus. Our gifts in heaven, our rewards in heaven are our family members. And this is where sin is like a nuclear bomb. This is where suicide is the nuclear bomb because when that person takes their life, the radiation immediately falls out. If you remember the story of the demon Legion, when Jesus cast Legion out of that man, the Legion had to go somewhere. Legion said, send me to those pigs, those thousands of pigs. And when he entered those thousands of pigs, they ran off a cliff and into the ocean. Mm -hmm. Suicide is the same way. Many, many people have experienced the death of a family member by suicide, only to see that demon start to come into their heart. Why, why me? Why do I deserve to live? Why do I deserve better? We see it time and time again. The families that, that the parents commit suicide, there's almost always a generational link to the next generation. And even if that's not the case, what about the believing that when the believer commits suicide, what about the belief of all of their friends, all of their family members, all of their acquaintances? All of a sudden, your faith is shaken to the core. Well, God, they believed. And look at what happened to them. God, they followed you. And yet, look at what happened to them. I can't believe in a God that takes away my mother. I can't believe in a God that takes away my father to something like suicide. Yes, you can because he didn't do that. You can believe that the devil did that. And you can believe in the devil in the sense that he exists and he's evil and he wants to come and kill and steal and destroy. Believe in God. Have a stronger faith in God than you do in the devil. He will bring us through. We have to make sure that we're taking care of each other. We have to make sure that we're not letting our prejudices and our thoughts get in the way of what God has intended for us. We need to be strong together. We have to be diligent together. We need to look out for one another. And more importantly than anything, we need to be calling on the Holy Spirit. We need to be in prayer for our community, for our family, our friends, our enemies, everybody. We need to be in prayer for the Holy Spirit to come on them and to come and search our souls. And find those dark places where those untoward thoughts come in. Those dark places where the depression comes on. And we need to ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, take away the depression. Take away the questioning. Take away the doubt. Lord, fill me up. Take the darkness. Shine a light on it. Lift me up and Lord, help me only to see you. Because then the victory is ours. Then we have the Holy Spirit right here in us. We have Jesus right here with us. And death can't affect us. We are saved. We have the great salvation. Tonight, we're cl closing sermon to our services with communion. And I pray that as you take the elements that you seek to restore your relationship with the Lord, that you seek to have the Holy Spirit come to you today and fill you up to find those dark places to come as we get ready to hand out the elements uh, jamie if you can hand out the elements today <coughs> we're going to be saying the lord's prayer and sometimes the world gets so hard that you just don't know what to pray you don't know what to say you don't you you have no idea even how to approach the lord with this problem this time go with the Lord's Prayer. 
It has every part of everything that we need to pray for. It's a prayer of repentance. It's a prayer to, to protect you from trespass, to, to protect you from temptation. It's a prayer of forgiveness, and that includes forgiveness of yourselves. Pray this prayer. Lean on him. Let's pray over the elements. Dear Lord, we just thank you for communion. We thank you for the opportunity to unite with you in communion. Lord, just as we take the elements, search our hearts, lift us up, Lord, fill us with the Holy Spirit so that we can see only you, that we follow you directly, Lord. No no untoward voices, no untoward anything, no, no influence from the devil himself, Lord. We break that off now. We pray in your name that as we go into communion, that we are so close to you, that your light shines abundantly from us, that no darkness can come. In Jesus' name. Let's stand for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And on that night, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, This is my body broken for you. Take and eat. He said, I have other sheep that are not in this fold. I must bring them also that they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. He did this for us so that his, his flock will know only his voice. No more thief, no more darkness, no more death. Right. He took the cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you for the remission of sin. This is God's new covenant. Jesus said, no one takes it, his life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I received from my father. His father gave him the charge to spill the blood to save us. This is the blood. He received that charge for one purpose only, and that was to call us to the kingdom. Amen. This evening, as we close in worship, I invite everybody to come up to the altar. Come and seek him. Whatever your situation is, wherever you've been, if you're, if you're living in a world where nothing bad is going on, there's no darkness, 
come up here to the altar and pray for those who aren't in that situation and come up here and worship him. We are a Pentecostal church. We should be dancing in the aisles when we are that blessed that we're not running into anything. If you're struggling with darkness, if you're struggling with these things that we've been talking about tonight, come to the altar, seek him, get close to him. Come together, congregation, and pray for those people who come to the altar. Put your hands on them, and let's pray those things away from them. We are a praying church. This is the time to get in prayer. However it comes, please come to the altar. Jen? <clears throat> Oh, 